Hey everyone, um, so I'm finally making this video about preparing for the winter and specifically uh, the management around single brood chamber colonies and what that looks like getting ready um, in through the fall and early winter here. So the video I did earlier this summer about um, why I prefer to manage single brood chambers got quite a lot of attention and that's why I'm, I'm going to continue on with that and, uh, and show you guys how I manage these hives in the fall and get them ready for the winter. And um, so a couple clarifications on that video before. When I said I manage single brood chambers uh, with the queen excluder, that's all year long. So a lot of people are asking how much honey do you leave or what kind of boxes do you leave on top? And the answer is none. I don't leave boxes on top for the winter. I like to run the queen excluder so that boxes up above are exclusively for honey. They get removed in the fall. Um, they're never exposed to mite treatments or anything like that. So I just keep my honey boxes totally separate and then we overwinter the colony in just the one box. And I think there was a bit more confusion. Um, maybe it was my fault the way I presented in that video, but I want to make it clear that this is not my method, as in like this is nothing new. Um, this isn't something that I'm pioneering in any way. The truth is uh, single brood chamber management of colonies uh, is the way I learned to keep bees and um, you know I've worked with dozens of beekeepers across this province and um, on a commercial level a huge number of colonies are managed uh, exclusively as single brood chambers. Um, so I think uh, I, maybe I took that a bit for granted in that just this is the way I learned to keep bees and um, my preferred method and I didn't I guess I mean I made the video in the first place because I knew some people hadn't been exposed to that style I didn't realize quite so much how how many people thought that this was new and shocking um, but the truth is it, it's not and it's a, it's a completely normal way to manage bees um, here in Ontario and the truth is across Canada, I know beekeepers in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, that uh, Alberta as well, that manage their bees in single brood chamber colonies. So throughout this video, um, I want to point you to a couple different resources. And one, um, if you're in Ontario, we just got the new edition of the Ontario Bee Journal. Just I think I just got it yesterday. And in this, there's an article um, by a friend of mine, my old colleague, former boss, uh, Les Eccles. And uh, he wrote an article, Managing and Overwintering Single Brood Chambers. And um, in this article, he talks about a lot of uh, benefits to single brood chambers. And so if you want to have a, if you get the OBJ, if you're here in Ontario anyway, um, have a look at this article. And he makes a lot of points in there, some points that I definitely didn't mention in my other video. And some things that I hadn't even really thought of regarding mite monitoring and mite treatments and, and how there can be benefits to managing single brood chambers. And he talks about overwintering in here too. So there's lots of other resources available. And um, before I get right into it, one other resource, I'm gonna link down below, uh, Paul Kelly at the University of Guelph. Um, they have a YouTube channel, which they started long before um, I did. And he has, uh, he has an excellent video about preparing for winter and they manage uh, single brood chamber colonies as well. I'm gonna link that video down below. You know, you shouldn't be getting all your information from one source, so I'll point you in a couple directions and you can double check, get some different opinions and do what works best for you. Okay, I'm gonna make this video about management surrounding uh, three or four factors here in the fall. And this is what can make managing single brood chambers a little bit more intensive, you have to think about these factors maybe a little bit more closely than you would have to with double brood chambers. So we want to talk about getting your honey off your hives, um, getting a mite treatment onto your hives, feeding, and how feeding relates to how much brood area remains in your colonies. Okay, so step one, remove the last of your honey super.
Okay, as we take off the last um, honey supers and I peel back the escape, so all the bees are down in one box here. And this is a full box of bees. What I recommend you do, um, as soon as you take down all your supers, or even um, as you're, even as you're putting the escapes on to get ready to take off your last supers, have a look in the brood chambers and see how much honey is in there on those outside frames. Um, because if there's no honey at all down in those brood chambers, you're going to want to feed right away when you take these supers off. Um, if there is, you know, at least a, one or two frames on each side with quite a bit of honey in them, then at least they're not going to starve to death. And so that's one of the, the biggest risks around managing single brood chambers is I have seen singles starve to death in the fall after removing honey supers prior to feeding sugar syrup. Um, so it's something you've got to be aware of, look at your hives, understand what's going on, at least feed something right away if you have to. In our case here at this yard and, uh, and the other three or four that I've uh, checked on in the last few days, there's, there's actually quite a bit of honey coming in. Um, there's a lot of goldenrod still flowering and the temperatures are amazing. This is like the best weather we've seen all summer. Um, so they're actually bringing in some nectar right now so I'm not worried about them starving to death at this point and they're going to pack away a little bit of that goldenrod honey into the brood chambers before I feed them heavy with uh, sugar syrup. Okay step two is to treat for mites. So once your honey boxes are off of your hives then you have an opportunity to treat your bees for varroa mites and the truth is um, I think that the timing that you take your honey boxes off should be dictated by your varroa mite levels. So, um, what we've talked about in the past, if you're monitoring for mites regularly throughout the season, you should know at what level they're at, you know, the middle of August, say for example, um, and that will dictate whether you want to get your honey boxes off sooner so that you can treat for mites if they're really high, or if you can wait until later into the fall um, and try and get any honey that's coming in from the goldenrod flows or anything else that happens to be out in September. Uh, in my case I knew my mite levels were relatively high, higher than I wanted them to be, so I'm getting all my honey off my hives in the first half of September. Uh, we're approaching right the middle of September now. All my honey is coming off and I can treat for mites now. And as far as what you want to actually use for a treatment, um, I'm obviously that's up to you so it depends like I'm in Canada and we have a specific set of products that are registered for use and I actually know from my um, YouTube analytics that most people that are watching this are in the United States and uh, registration for products is different depending on what country you're in when you're in England it's different Australia New Zealand every country has to have products registered differently and uh, so whether you want to use a formic acid treatment or a product like Apovar or something like Thymovar, um, it's going to depend on what your mite levels are and where you are in the world as to what's available to you. What I'm going to do is link a document um, specifically for Ontario, and I'll flash it up here. Um, this is a document that's put out by um, our provincial Ministry of Agriculture yearly. Uh, where I used to work, we used to help uh, put this document together every year, so I know it's it's gone through yearly and updated based on pest and disease status of of Ontario and what's actually registered and available to use. So it's a good document to have a look at um, if you're here and if you're elsewhere. Then I'm sure you know your various states or or the country that you're in um, probably puts out a similar document that you can have a look at and make your decision. But the point is, treat for mites. There's a paper that um, I think you guys should have a look at. If you can, I'll flash it up here and you can Google it or if I'm able to, I might be able to link it um, below. But um, this study was done by uh, quite a few people that I know at the University of Guelph. 
And the point of the study is, you know, of all the factors that affect our bees over winter, uh, which of these factors has the most impact on their survival? And the conclusion of the study was that uh, high Varroa mite levels are most linked to colony death over winter here in Ontario. Um, so if there's you know one factor you need to get under control to have healthy bees that are going to survive, it's Varroa mites. And that goes, it doesn't matter if you're running single chambers, double brood chambers, anything, however you want to manage your bees, you've got to uh, manage your Varroa mite levels as well. So it's incredibly important. The other thing that article talks about um, is actual cluster size, so you know colony population going into the winter, and uh, food, um, food stores. So how heavy these brood chambers weigh after you've fed them late into the fall. So those are also really big factors of how well your colonies are going to be able to survive the winter. Um, so there's lots to consider. So in short, you got your honey boxes off, now you treat for mites.